Hey, thanks for joining us online today. We truly believe that God wants to do so much in you and through you wherever you are in life. As you listen to this message, we encourage you to open your mind and open your heart to what God is saying. You can also follow along with the sermon notes we've provided in our website or in the church app. today, everybody. Happy Sunday. Walked up here with my water bottle. I didn't mean to do that. Hey, what a great day it is. Doesn't it feel amazing outside? Thank the Lord. It feels so good. Hey, my name is Pastor Mitchell. I'm super excited, honored to be speaking today. Pastor Brad asked me to speak a couple weeks ago, and it's always an honor. I said, yes, sir. I'd love to. And uh, so let me first say, Welcome if it's your first time here today. Just super honored that you're here. And I uh, want a couple housekeeping things real quick. Want to address everybody joining us online. Hey, so honored that you're joining us wherever, wherever you're joining us from today. We're thankful for technology. Uh, you know, we're getting into summertime. We're gonna go on vacations. And so you may already be out there on vacation. Maybe you're home. You're not feeling well. But I wanna encourage you at the same time. I know sometimes uh, we can miss a step. We can get out a rhythm. And maybe you're home because uh, you, you've been there and it's gotten a little too comfortable. Well, I just wanna tell you, we got plenty of room in the house. There's nothing like being in the house. Come on, right, everybody? Nothing like being in the house. Yeah, yeah. So we wanna invite you back, but take all the time you need if it's for some health reason. We completely understand. And uh, growth track, everybody say two weeks. Two weeks. The beginning of every month, we re-kickstart growth track. So we have growth track step one starting in two weeks. I wanna invite you to come out. Maybe you've been coming to Lakeshore for a while and you've kind of been sitting. You're like, you know what? I, I think I need to do more. I think God has called me to, to do more. Well, we are a church of next steps, and we want to help you take your next step in your journey with Christ. And there's something that happens that whenever you step out, uh, not to just fill a position, but, but to serve. We see this for those who are on the dream team who go on a mission trip, whatever it is. You always go to serve, help make a difference, and God always does something in your life. So we wanna encourage you to come out again in two weeks to growth track step one and find your place. We have a seat waiting for you at Growth Track with your name on it, all right? So come out and join us. Hey, we're gonna jump into the talk today, and I'm gonna pray real quick before we do that. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We pray that you would speak to us today. Help us to leave here changed and transformed by your power. Come on, and everybody said... Amen. Well, hey, I wanna encourage you to take some notes today. I feel like I've got a fresh word for you, and I feel like uh, something happens when you don't just hear it, but when you hear it and when you write it down, whether you're putting it in your phone or physically writing it, I wanna encourage you to take some notes today. We're in week two of a series called Signs and Seasons. How many of y'all were here last week? Pastor Brad kicked off this message. Man, wasn't that good? Such a good word. I wanna encourage you, if you ever miss a Sunday, you can go online to any of our online platforms and you can rewatch uh, the message, all right? So go on, you can follow along, that way you don't ever skip a beat. Uh, today, he t Pastor Brad talked about how to navigate the difficult seasons that come in life. Because the truth is, it's not if they come. They're gonna come, right? You might find yourself today, you're, you're in a difficult season, maybe you're coming out of a, dis, a difficult season, you might be about to go into one, but we need to know what does the Bible say, what does scripture say, and how to navigate those difficult seasons. Today, here we go, we're gonna be talking about, ready, 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 how to make wise choices. Everybody go, ooh, right? Yeah, how to make wise choices. We all have choices that we have to make every single day, and we need to know how to make not just make a choice, but how do we make the wisest choice? How, how does God and scripture help us do that? And our key verse is found in Ecclesiastes. Let's read through this. For everything there is a season, a time for everything, every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to, to tear down, and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. I like that one. A time to laugh. A time to grieve. A time to dance. A time to scatter stones. A time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time, did I get, here we go. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. 
a time for war and a time for peace. So the truth is, every single one of us, we all have decisions, we all have choices that we have to make every single day, right? Some of us, we have some, some small choices, we have some, some big choices, sometimes we make some decisions, some choices with, without even thinking about it, right? We get up, they're just routine, some things that we do. But some of us have some choices, and every single one of us, if you're not facing it right now, we're gonna have some choices that we have. They're gonna be more long-lasting, impactful choices and decisions that we, that we have to make. And for every single one of us today, we all have things that are pulling for our time. We all have things that are pulling for our emotions and our attentions, and it can be so easy to overlook what's most important for what's, what's screaming at us the loudest. So we have to be careful in the choices that we make. In fact, uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle once asked the question, I like this, he said, what do you think the difference is between those who really are making a difference and who are really uh, fulfilled and the rest of the world? And I like to say it this way, is that it really, it, really, it really boils down to our decisions. Our decisions are incredibly and indescribably important. In fact, I would say it this way, that the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our life. The quality of our decisions, so here's the big cue for today. Y'all ready for this? What kind of life do you wanna have? If we're talking about our choices, we're talking about our decisions and how they have uh, the opportunity to change our life and not just our life, but others around us. We have to start with what kind of life do we wanna have? I remember being a kid and going through a season, and maybe we all do this. Uh, I, I remember going through a season of just indecision. I remember my own kids doing this, but I remember being a kid and my dad, simple things. It didn't even really matter, but he's like, hey, where do you wanna go eat? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know, where, wherever you wanna go. And he's like, you wanna go to the store with me? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I, I kind of feel bad, like I wanna go, but I don't wanna miss what I'm doing at home, and just silly indecision stuff. But he finally got to the point where my dad'd be like, all right, well, I'm gonna stand right here until you make up your mind. And I'd be like, oh, no, don't do that. Like, I hated it, right? I hated him doing that, but the truth is, is that indecision in itself is a decision. But God has called us to be people who move, people of action. God has called us not to be people of indecision, but people of faith, people of confidence, because, when, because it's Christ who is in us who is helping us make the wise choices. The decisions that we make in life have the power to change the course of our direction, even the trajectory of our life, but more importantly, not just our lives, but affect other lives around us. Many times, it's the greatest decisions that are born out of the greatest pain, the greatest struggle, the greatest turmoil that we face in life. And, uh, you know, I, I've kind of recently become a, a fan of, of, of really just all things space. I don't know why. It just is suddenly piqued my curiosity. Like, I'm talking about real space, like NASA, okay? Not like sci-fi. I like a good movie, but all things NASA, it's just kind of suddenly piqued my, my curiosity. I think it would be like the coolest thing to, to go see a rocket launch one day, just to see the, the power of this rocket ship that is leaving Earth. But I wanna take a moment. There's an event that took place in the space program many years ago that really became a pivotal moment of decision, deciding to either move this space program forward or to stop altogether taking great strides in the space race. Now, Levi Lesko uh, recently wrote a book called The Last Supper on the Moon. It's an incredible book. And there's this story that he tells about this moment. I wanna read just this section of it. It's really interesting. After the massive success of the Mercury and Gemini program, NASA sets its sights on the Apollo mission, thinking that they could do no wrong, but death quickly followed their overconfidence. He went on to describe that the, during the Apollo 1 mission, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee burned to death, strapped in the cockpit of their command module. Fire broke out while they were belted in on the launch pad for a dress rehearsal. Everyone knew that space was dangerous, and they knew that it could be deadly, but no one thought such a horrific tragedy would happen on the ground. Michael Collins, who would go on later to be a part of the Apollo 11 mission, was friends with the astronauts who died. And he had the impossible job of notifying one of the, the widows of the husbands who, who died 
And he later went on to describe how it caught them all off guard and, and why really it shouldn't have. He said that we were worried about engines that wouldn't start, that wouldn't stop. He said we worried about leaks, uh, how cabin pressure might reduce, might be reduced to stop the fire in space. But right here on the ground, when we should have been most alert, we put three guys inside of an untried spacecraft, strapped them into couches, locked two cumbersome hatch doors behind them, and left them no way of escaping a fire. It was a tense time, and really, as you look at history right then, there's a lot of things happening in the world and the economy that look very similar to what's happening today. So here they were in this tense time, not just in the world, but also what's happening in NASA. And many thought that the Apollo 1 mission spelled the end of the space agency. But check this out. In the days that followed, NASA's Director of Flight Operations, Gene Krantz, knowing he had to do something. He made a decision to give an incredible message of truth and vulnerability to his team. And they later on went to call this speech the speech that saved NASA. All of the men in Missions Operation Control Room listened in stunned silence as he pulled no punches but instead he assumed responsibility and called everyone to a higher standard. It galvanized the team and caused everyone to shoulder the share of the blame, to learn from their mistakes, and to redouble their efforts. And we're gonna read this speech together right here. It says, space flight will never tolerate the carelessness, incapacity, and neglect. Somewhere, somehow, we screwed up. We could have been, it could have been in design, build, or test. Whatever it was, we should have caught it. We were too gung-ho about the schedule and we locked out all the problems we saw each day in our work. Every element of the program was in trouble, and so were we. The simulators were not working. Mission control was behind in virtually every area, and the flight and test procedures changed daily. Nothing we did had any shelf life, not one of us stood up and said, I'm not gonna repeat what he said. Explicit word, stop it. Nobody stood up and said, stop it. I don't know what Thompson's committee will find as the cause, but I know what I find as the cause. We are the cause. He says, we were not ready. We did not do our jobs. We were rolling the dice, hoping that things would come together by launch day when in our hearts we knew it would take a miracle. We were pushing the schedule, betting that the cape would slip before we did. From this day forward, flight control will be known by two words, tough and competent. He went on to say, tough means we are forever accountable for what we do or what we fail to do. We will never again compromise our responsibilities. Every time we walk into mission control, we will know what we stand for. Competent means we will never take anything for granted. We will never be found short in our knowledge, in our skills. Mission control will be perfect. When you leave this meeting today, you will go to your office, and the first thing that you will do is you're gonna write tough and competent on your blackboard and it will never be erased. Each day when you enter the room, these words will remind you of the price paid by Grissom, White, Chaffee. These words are the price of admission to the ranks of mission control. Holy cow. What a powerful message. And this, this speech that he gave before everyone not only like supercharged them and gave them the energy and the focus that they needed, but it provided the right kind of mindset and the resolve to take the next step, to not stop, but to move forward, to not compromise, to, to not cut corners, but to make the best and the wisest decisions and choices in order to always be ready. And for every single one of us today, listen right here, the highest price of admission has been paid for you and for me. And we don't wanna get to graduation day 
in heaven and find out that we were not ready, that we didn't do our job, that we didn't do our best. Today, we're being called up and we're being called out to assume responsibility because we are called to a higher standard. Let's never again take anything for granted, amen? First Chronicles uh, 12, 32, it, it starts talking about the tribe of Issachar who were um, one of the 12 tribes of Israel and they could see the signs of the times and they really saw them as opportunities. In fact, scripture, it says in 1 Corinthians, it says, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives and all these men understood the signs of the times and they knew the best course for Israel to take. Okay, so here we are, we're talking about signs and seasons and understanding the signs. My first question would be, how did they understand it? How did they understand the signs of the times? They understood because they operated out of a mindset of wisdom and discernment. Not one out of emotion or pride, but of wisdom and discernment, which is something that Jesus considered an important ability. In fact, scripture goes on in Proverbs 4, 7. It says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do, and whatever else you do, develop good judgment. So what is wisdom, all right? Again, I'll remind you, take some notes today. Here's what wisdom is. Wisdom is the proper application of God's principles of cause and effect in our thinking, our relationships, in our career, in health, in finances, and in our spiritual life. So you're here today, you might be facing some questions, some some choices, some decisions that you have to make. The first kind of wisdom that we need is the proper application of God's principles. So how do I choose through this thinking to have better thoughts in my life? How do I make better spending decisions according to God's principles? How do I choose a better response when I'm angry? How do I make choices that convey love and respect to my spouse? What are the best choices I can make on behalf of my children and their future? How do I avoid, how do I avoid making a big mistake? How do I begin and sustain a healthy lifestyle choice? Uh, Which daily decisions will bring the greatest promotion and favor in my life? How can I choose to honor God in all areas of my life? This may be one of your questions today. You may have a different question, but the first thing we need to do in making wise choices is we always pray about it and go to God's word first. And when you're done, you do it again. You pray about it and go to God's word first. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I love this. It says, don't worry about anything. It said, pray about everything. Everybody say everything. Everything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. It goes on in Proverbs 2, 6. It says, for the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Come on, I love scripture. It's so chock full of of encouraging scripture and truth. Proverbs continues, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed by your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord. Pastor Brad talked about this kind of fear last week. Fear of the Lord. It's, it's, it's knowing who God is in your, life, in your life. It's a holy reverence. Who is God? And turn away from evil. And then one more. Look at this. In 1 Corinthians. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Every choice for the glory of God. Every decision for the glory of God. Every step for the glory of God. It's not about us. It's not about elevating ourselves. It's about elevating his name in the earth. And that starts in our choices, in our decisions, not our our ambitions, but making his name famous. So ask yourself this week before making any decisions. First, have I prayed about this? And if you have it, that's the first thing you do. And then ask, what does the Bible say about it? 
Go to truth, that's God's word. What does the Bible say about it? And then ask, who can help me better understand what God's word says about this decision? Secondly today, when making wise choices, in the words of Dragnet Sergeant Joe Friday, anybody know? Just the facts, ma'am. Number two, take the time to gather the facts. Proverbs 19 says it this way. It says, it is dangerous and sinful to rush into the unknown. And any parents in here, no matter what Elsa or Anna says, don't run into the unknown without the facts, okay? Uh, Proverbs 14, it says only simpletons, simpletons talking about a person who's foolish or gullible, um, only simpletons believe everything they're told. The prudent carefully consider their steps. The wise are cautious and avoid dangerous. I wanna be known as a wise person. I want to be cautious. Fools plunge ahead with recklessness. And look at this, uh, Proverbs, this is, this is spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolishness. Did I already do that one? No, I didn't, I didn't, sorry. So look at this next, look at this next. I love this, Peter Drucker said, once the facts are clear, the decisions jump at you. You know what that means? That means that once the facts are clear, one decision, the decisions and the answers, they present themselves to you. Once the facts are there, 99% of the time, you're gonna know what decision you need to make. In other words, if you're being rushed into a, to make a rush decision or a rash decision, I've never seen that usually turn out good for people. You need to take a step back and you need to ask, uh, God, what do I need to be here? Why? Because God is a God of order. He's not gonna push you into something. He's not gonna make you rush into something. Stop, take a step back, pray about it until you have all the facts and you have peace about it. Proverbs 18, 17, look at this. It says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So realize that perception is not always reality. Just because it seems right doesn't mean it is right. So what do we, what do we have to do? We, we have to be discerning. Be careful about your own emotions. If you're really emotional about something, that's not a good time to make a decision, okay? Especially when you're angry, when, when you're offended, when you're tired, when you're hungry or when you're frustrated. Uh, and any white Christmas fans in here? I'm, I'm talking golden oldie, there's like two people, okay? White Christmas, I think about Rosemary Clooney, there's this scene in there, she's, she's getting upset and everyone's asking her, honey, do you just need a sandwich? And she's like, why is everybody asking me if I need a sandwich? That, that's what we call hangry, okay? Sometimes we just need a sandwich and it will change your life. It will help you make a good decision. Always remember there's two sides to every story. There's always two sides to every story, so take time to gather the facts. So number one, we're gonna pray about it. We're gonna pray about it, we're gonna get in God's word. Then we're gonna take time to gather the facts. And then number three, we're gonna count the cost. Luke 14, 28 says this. It says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction on a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Proverbs 21 says, steady, plotty bring, steady plotting brings prosperity. Hasty speculation brings poverty. Proverbs 22, it says, choose a good reputation over great riches. Many of us, we're trying to go in life to, to make the most so we can look like that specific person. But scripture says that's not what's most important. Choose a good reputation over good riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. And look at Proverbs 10, 9. It says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. But he who makes his way crooked will be found out. So, so we gotta count the cost, so we have to ask ourselves today, have I counted the cost before making this decision? Have I prayed about it? Have I gone in scripture? Have I gotten the facts about it? And then I, have I counted the cost? Have I considered how this might affect my integrity, my credibility, and my witness for God? H have I considered how is this gonna affect me and my family in the long game? 
Y'all know that, that movie, Cheaper by the Dozen? I think there's actually like three versions of it now. My, my favorite is good old Steve Martin version, okay? Here he is, and he's in life, he's got like a million kids, I've got a lot of kids, he's got a lot of kids. Um, and here he is, and one day he finally has the chance to, to coach the football team that he's always wanted to coach from his alma mater, and it means that he gets to move and get a bigger house and make more money, and he can get more clothes for his kids, and he's thinking about all these things that are gonna be better and bigger, and we can do more, but it also means that he's gotta uproot his family, that they have to move to a new place, that they gotta go to a new school, that they gotta make new friends, that they have to do all these things things, and in the end of the story, what he thinks is going to make them bigger, better, make them happier, and a closer family almost rips their family apart. And you see this in so many lives today. Why did this happen? Because he didn't count the cost when it mattered most. Number four, you got to surround yourself with wise counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen says this, where there is no counsel, the people will fall. But in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Scripture goes on to say, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 18, it says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires. God never created us to be people who isolate ourselves. He built us for community. He built us for relationship. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. So ask yourself these questions today. Have I separated myself from my circle of wisdom? We have this saying here at the church you may have heard. It's called small groups. It is an incredible circle of wisdom to get connected with people of like-minded faith who are going through life together, who are being honest together, who can share the burdens together, who can pray for you. Who Have, have I separated myself from my circle of wisdom? Who, I, who have I allowed into my life to speak truth into the blind spots in my life? Every single one of us, we have blind spots in our lives and we have to allow specific people who we trust, who can speak things into our lives, not just what we wanna hear. No, we need people who can speak truth into our lives to tell us what we need to hear. It's being tough, it's being competent, it's not always easy. But that's how we should approach Jesus' words to his church. He's giving us the chance to grow, to get better. He's leaning in. He's loving us and, and speaking truth into us. Many people today, uh, at, at, at the sound of, of, hey, let me help you um, grow in this area, or when all the, the good feelings are gone, what do they do? They bolt. They're out of there, right? But, but I like this right here. Troy Aikman, come on, the glory days. Troy Aikman said this right here. He said, he says, I never once threw a pass in my time in the NFL that wasn't critiqued. In other words, he went on to say that the higher you go in a sport, the more you receive coaching. I like to say this, that the higher you grow in life, the more you should receive coaching. No less. It's the same in our life. And this means, listen, that we need to carry the mindset in, in our family, in, in our business, our career of never arriving in other words, we, we all kind of set this peak moment of this is where I want to get to, and we think once I get here, everything's going to be great. Don't ever get that mindset of arriving, but always striving for growth, striving for growth in our walk with God. And when you do that, it does two things. It keeps you humble, and it keeps you steadfast. Proverbs twenty thirty. look at this. It says, wounds that hurt cleanse evil and strips clean out the inside of the heart. Our response to correction in our life should be that of gratitude. That's not usually something we learn when we're a young kid, but we learn through life's challenges. Correction is not rejection, but correction is, is God speaking truth to us. Correction does not equal rejection. And you can't get better without it. Hebrews 12, six, it says this. The Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And in 2018, I found myself 
in, in, a, uh, in a meeting with Pastor Brad that really changed the course correction of my current staffing position at Lakeshore. And it wasn't a cause of any immoral mess or anything like that, but that memory of that moment, it stands out in my mind because of what Pastor Brad spoke to me in the next few moments that showed me that he cared enough to speak some things into my life that needed correcting. Some areas that I had become blind to. And I wasn't expecting it. And it stung in the moment. But instead of taking my things and leaving, I listened. I listened to what he had to say and I took heart. And I made some changes based on what was spoken to my life that day. And can I tell you something? I became better for it. And my, my family became better for it. And I don't remember much else about what happened that day or that week, but I'll never forget how much I appreciated the opportunity to grow and improve as a person. And I'm so thankful that he cared enough to speak truth into my life. We all need those people in our lives. That that is what surrounding yourself with wise counsel looks like. It's allowing others to speak into the blind spots in your life even though it might sting in the moment, it's helping you grow into who God called you and created you to be, to get better, to grow stronger, to be tougher, more competent, more confident in who he made you to be. And then number five, the last one, how to make better choices, how to make wise decisions. Number five, you gotta follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. Scripture says in Isaiah 30, 21, it says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Wherever you turn to the right, uh, sorry, wherever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Proverbs 3, six through eight, it says, seek his will in all you do and he will show you, if you will just seek his will, be patient, he's gonna show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom, instead fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing in your body and strength for your bones. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. And this is the last scripture I want you to get today. This is in Deuteronomy. It says, today I have given you the choice between life and death. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. So listen, you might be here today You've got some big decisions this week that you need to make. You've got some choices that you, you're waiting that you've just been thinking on. But the truth is, every single one of us today, Jesus has given us a choice to make. And it's a choice that God has given us to choose life or death. And it's the greatest decision, the greatest choice that you will ever make in your life that will not only affect your life, but future generations because of your choice. And what I want us to do right now is I want us to take a moment. If every single one in here, if you would, if you would bow your heads with me, if you would just take some time, close your eyes, and I just want you to reflect on what I've been speaking this morning, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, with all heads bowed, say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me today? And I'm gonna end today with the same question that I started with. What kind of life do you want to have today? It's a simple question. Do you wanna have a life that's filled with love, with joy, with unexplainable peace that leads to everlasting life? Or do you wanna have a life that's filled with what the world offers, which is emptiness, fake, cheap, full of chaos and confusion. The choice is yours. Today, Christ is calling every single one of us to choose. And what he offers today is completely free. You did nothing to deserve it. 
And all you have to do is choose wisely today to say yes to Jesus, to start a brand new life with him. So if you're here today, and maybe you've never asked Jesus into your heart, or maybe you've been distant from God for a very long time and you're ready to come home, you wanna start a real relationship with Jesus today, just simply ask him, say, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Fill me with your presence. Just tell him, say, I need a fresh start with you. And what I wanna do right now is I don't want you to be embarrassed. No one's looking around. This is just a moment between you and God. And if that's you today, you're simply expressing outwardly what Jesus is doing inwardly. Would you just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. Hey Amen, I see you. Hey Amen, I see you. Hey Amen, come on. For those of you who just raised your hand, and maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you're like, that is me. We're gonna pray a prayer right now. And it's making the choice that's gonna change your life forever. So every single voice, every single person in here today, let's all pray this together. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, I need you. I repent of making my life a mess. Forgive me for trusting my own wisdom and doing my own thing. Repeat after me. Say, today, Jesus, I put my trust in you. You gave your life for me, so I give my life for you. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for hearing my prayer, forgiving my sin, and filling me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online for today's message. If you made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to send you a brand new Bible and devotional to help you in your new journey of faith. To get these resources or to submit a prayer request, fill out our digital communication card by texting Lakeshore to 94000. We'd love to celebrate what God is doing in your life and help you with your next steps. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.